In 1879, actually, in this church, there was a little mini revival, and uh, 70 people were saved in a matter of weeks. And the Lord moved mightily, and out of that actually came, uh, I think it was five or six who went into full-time ministry from that, just that small little period. And we're just praying that God will, will do something again and take more of this island for himself. Well, I grew up coming to this church, and my family was here, so ever since I can remember, I was in Sunday school and in church. When I was two, my mom became a Christian, and she yeah, talked to me about the Lord. Her and I would pray together when I was young. And then when I was about eight years old, I was at a Bible club, a boys club, in the basement of this church, and a man named Jim Shear, who was a missionary in Margaree at the time, uh, held a Bible club for boys, and he was sharing the gospel at every meeting. And at one of those meetings, I can still remember where I was sitting in the basement of this church, I just bowed my head and asked Christ to forgive me and come into my life. And my brother Ross, actually, he was older than me by 10 years. He got saved when I was about 15, and he started a Bible study in his home and for about, with about five men. And as a teenager, I began to go to that. And it would be like from 6.30 till 11 at night. And it impacted me greatly, actually, and steadied me. And his salvation was a great encouragement to me as a teenager. And then when I uh, graduated from high school, I went to University of New Brunswick. And I got involved. I was fearful because a lot of people, kids had gone out of our church. And when they went to university, they fell away from the Lord. So when I was going to university in 1988, I really had an intention to get involved in whatever I could. And so in that year, I grew like I never did before and um, just felt like actually a pull to want to study the Bible. So after that year, one year, was a five-year engineering program. I decided to go to Ontario Bible College in Toronto at the time. It's Tyndale now. And, and after four years, I took a Bachelor of uh, Theology uh, in Missions with a missions focus thinking I would go on missions somewhere and kind of set apart my mornings after the first year um, to have my classes in the afternoon and evenings to study the Bible in the mornings on my own because there's over 30 some different denominations at that college and there was all kinds of beliefs. And so I thought I need to know what I believe. And uh, so I set apart the mornings for that personal study. And as I grew in that it's like when you kind of saturate yourself in the Word of God, actually it can take you down. I began to be convicted in a way that I had never been in my life. Uh, and just, I don't know, it, it, it caused a struggle almost in my life. But at the end of my um, 93, when I graduated, I went to India for a month with a team and met believers there that just seemed so full of the Lord. And so... Kind of the two things unfold together. The conviction I felt in my own personal life of need or lack of what I saw in the Bible and what I felt in my own life. And then these believers in India, I just began to cry out for God and seek God. And I just encountered the Lord in a wonderful way. I surrendered my life in a way that I'd never had before. I got married in 1995. And we moved out west and then came back to Toronto in 1997 to become an associate pastor. While I was there uh, for four years, um, I actually felt the Lord speaking to me in a prayer meeting, calling me into full-time ministry. My home church here in Marguerite, we were without a pastor and they uh, sent Pierre Chesson up to visit us to see if we were interested, if I was interested in becoming the pastor of this church. And so in, 19, er, in 2001, uh, we moved back home here to Cape Breton. And yeah, the, we've been here ever since. The Lord began to place on our hearts the need of Cape Breton Island. And so we began to go in the direction of church planting. Well, on Cape Breton, there's about 130,000 people, and 
it would be about 1%, less than 1% would claim to be born again. So 99% of people uh, would not even like that term or would not want to associate themselves with that or have a belief in the Bible. There's a lot of religious people in Cape Breton. Um, but we began to see, I began to see churches close their doors all over the island. In a five-year period, they used to put them in the, artic in the article in the local paper, about 25 churches closed their doors. And I began to feel the need of that, the need of the gospel in so many communities. Probably about 75% of the communities on the island have no gospel preaching church that would believe that the scriptures, the inerrant word of God, and would believe that Christ is the only way uh, to be reconciled to God and what his sacrifice on the cross meant. Um, and so we began to have people from other communities come to this church. Now this Pierre Chesson was in this church and he was hired on as a full-time evangelist. And so he was doing Bible studies in different communities across on this side of the island, about three communities. And out of that, we'd have people come and some from other communities and we began to just feel the need to start things in other communities. I took a it's DCPI, Dynamic Church Planting International course. And while I was taking that, I, it's just like I felt God putting on my heart it's almost like he gave me a picture of a rock being thrown into a pond and, you know, the ripples that come out. And it was like, well, this church by itself cannot ripple out so far. But if you throw another rock, well, then that ripples out. So if we start a, another church in another community, it can ripple out into that community. We can ripple out from our community and there'll be just more of the gospel going out. And that's how, how I kind of saw it. And... It's just like I came back just knowing that we need to start other churches in these communities. It's it's nice to have a full church here, like we were averaging probably 120 to 140 here in a, in a small country church. That feels pretty good. But how many people are going to come from half hour away, 40 minutes away, 45 minutes away? And, you know, the Cabot Trail along that five-hour drive, there was... Only one other small gospel preaching church of about 25 people in five hours of driving. And so we're like, we need to start to reach these communities. And anyway, we begin to hold, uh, we begin to do Bible studies in these communities. And then in Bedeck, our first area, we began a, a, um, a kids group. We began to go door to door. And then after a few years, we started another Bible study, evangelistic one. Then after another year or two, we started a gospel meeting on Sunday evenings, once a month. Then it went to twice a month. And then we had about 50 people in that community in Bedeck. And from there, we called a pastor. And that was in 2010. Shetty Camp, we started in 2012. Um, and I mean, that's after years of Shetty Camp of, of doing ministry. Pierre did door to door, had a Bible study of about 20 some people, um, years of getting to these points. And we had open air meetings and same with Inverness, that was in 2015, we started there. But years of ministry, years of labor, years of prayer. Um, and, and the Lord began to grow uh, these churches. And we've had definitely had some setbacks. Um, because where the Lord is moving, Satan is not quiet and seeks to do whatever he can to separate. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the need, yeah, is, is everywhere. We just feel it. Um, you know, I remember being in a community in Bay St. Lawrence around the Cabot Trail, about two and a half hours from us, and Pierre was holding an open air meeting, and there's a little house on the mountains, uh, on the side of the mountain, and I was looking at it, and it's just it's like the Spirit said to me, who will, who will reach that house? So, it's like, Lord... May you do something on this island. And uh, so we've been here, you know, 20, 23 years now, and I grew up here. But the island is still so much unreached. And by the grace of God, there's three three other churches on this side of the island. And, uh, and yet still so many communities without anything. 
but we now have an internship of young guys. There's 11, and James is one of them in North Sydney, and praise the Lord, God has placed them there in North Sydney, and a huge unreached community of 6,000. And, and, you know, the we're praying that God will raise up some of these young guys to be church planters and and leaders here in the church, and that God will just will just pour out His Spirit upon us and do something on this island. I think I remember John Piper saying that we need to live lives of missionary sacrifice in North America. Like that's how people are reached and have been reached through all the centuries, and we've kind of lost that missionary sacrifice life, and that we would. I don't know, I think we need to, that God would renew that in our day, that we would give up this world for the sake of Christ and go into these unreached communities and, and evangelize. You can pray that, I mean, amongst these interns that God will really fall upon them, that, that they will begin to have a burden that they cannot put out and that they will go to these communities. Um, that's why we have the internship and that, that the Lord will, um, even door to door, we're going door to door. Oh, we just, that that the Lord would work in sometimes those short little visits at the door. I mean, sometimes we get invited in and we have longer conversations, but sometimes it just seems so brief uh, that we're talking to someone, but we're leaving tracks with them and sometimes Bibles, that God will just begin to bless even the reading of a verse like we're about to go on a stretch of, of road. And the last time I went to our there was 10 years ago. It's like sometimes you have a little visit and it's like, Lord, when are we gonna get back to that house? And so unless the Lord seems to work with us, in a greater way, it just seems like most of the island's going to be lost. It's like, you know, I often have this picture of the Lord, you know, the disciples rowing in the boat and the wind and waves are against them and they're not making much headway. Sometimes that's the way it feels. And unless the Lord comes uh, and steps into the boat uh, where they were immediately at the shore, they're unless the Lord just steps in in some kind of greater way with us and quickens his word and empowers us in just a new way that we just see his word go run and have strength, like in times of revival. Uh, you can just pray for that. That's our greatest need, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah.